Ora, boa tarde a todos. Ainda não chegámos ao quarto da hora académico, mas eu não gosto muito do quarto da hora académico. Gosto que, seja mais, que sejamos mais pontuais. Uh, vou pedir licença, mas vou falar em inglês, porque me pediram que alguns dos nossos convidados percebam menos bem o português do que o inglês. Uh, e, por outro lado, o inglês é mais adaptado para muitas das coisas que eles vão dizer. So, welcome. Thank you very, very much for your presence here. Today we are going to have a session, to me, a rather unusual one, because when I think about the periodic table, I never think about mathematics. I think about something regular, something highly intuitive, which happened to match nature, uh, without you knowing, uh, not you, but the, the person that <laughs> invented the periodic table, that, that was so close to nature. To me, this is fantastic. It only means that mathematics is inbred in nature which is something very often people think mathematics is abs too abstract, has nothing to do with nature, which I don't believe. Honestly, I don't believe. I think it has a lot to do with in, na in nature. The more we look into nature, the more we see math all over the place. So today we are going to have a, a diff an unusual session, as far as I am concerned, which is math applied to the periodic table. I'll, I'll thank the speakers, and in particular I'll thank Zé Francisco, because he put up the session, invited the people. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll give him the floor. Zé Francisco, please. I'm going to sit there because I want to see what you're going to project. Thank you very much, Carlos, uh, for your nice words of inter introduction. In fact, uh, it's a question, non-trivial question, Maybe the quadrivium could explain later in the future why mathematics has to do with periodic table. Because, in fact, uh, if you ask Newton, probably Newton will uh, answer something, well, at that time, his time didn't know the periodic table. Nevertheless, he wrote Principia, uh, Mathematical Principles for Natural Philosophy, for nature. Okay? And maybe up to now, probably mathematics does not bring anything very relevant up to now to the periodic table. It's a description that has maybe inside some mathematical principles or some mathematical techniques can be used to, to advance our understanding and our classification of the elements, which, of course, uh, the first version is this uh, uh, table with the 60, 61 elements at that time, I think, the first edition. Because there are several uh, question marks. If you count, there are more than 61, but there are several question marks that are probably already the predictions, I presume. I just this is in Russian, the, the original table of uh, uh, Mendeleev from 1869. And in fact, this is, uh, well, in fact, together with uh, my colleague and friend, Antonio Corbe from Madrid, which was, uh, but uh, still uh, the director of this ICMAT, this was a joint initiative of these two members of their COM, which is the, this uh, club of the institutes and centers of the European Math Society that we met in Cambridge and we put together this idea in March after I have read a very inspiring article in El Pais uh, this January that we'll see later. Okay, so in fact, um, you read probably my abstract that was my good intentions to make this general uh, uh, and also not for the layman, for the lay scientist, which is not a chemist. I'm not a chemist, and for chemists, my knowledge of chem chemistry is very, very limited. Even for respect to mathematics methods or mathematics encounters with the periodic table, I understood that my mathematics is very far, so it's not my ex expertise. But nevertheless, uh, I think I found, I've been learning since uh, I put this uh, challenge to our speakers today, this uh, a uh, fascinating team, this um, mathematical aspects of periodic table, and of course I go to be based on others. Clearly, uh, everybody knows this table. I've seen it at least once. This is the official, the official periodic table of the, the UPAC, and of course everybody knows this, uh, knows that in fact this is uh, not directly, but indirectly, this is also a mathematical object. You have row and columns and rows. This is a matrix. The structure is not exactly uh, very close to linear algebra, but this 
this is a matrix, clearly, okay? Of course, this is a, a, a two-dimensional representation of this classification, the most uh, useful and, of course, the, the well-known. Uh, but I just read, I did not check, but probably you should know better than me, there are more than 1,000. They were in sight with more than 1,000 periodic tables with all variants. I believe that one of them is this one, which is, of course, the, the European Chemical Society put forward just to, to make an alert about the, the, the elements that are in danger. You see, the red ones are in danger. Those do have this mark, are you used in your mobile phone? And this is to, to make a, a, a very um, timely alert to the, uh, the problems that they have with some elements like lithium. Now it's becoming very controversial in Portugal because it seems that we have a lot of lithium in Portugal. And uh, uh, of course there are others uh, as you can see. And these are the areas are related to the quantities. Uh, 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 in fact, there is a proportion uh, of the area of this uh, uh, deformed table with the 90 elements that make everything. Of course, they are basic, the, the real, real elements for, in particular, to do the, the mobile phones that are these symbols here. And of course, there's this digital legend. But of course, uh, this is being a celebration this year. And this, in a certain sense, uh, our session today is the fourth of a series of sessions that the uh, Academy of Science of Lisbon promoted by the our colleagues from chemistry, and this is the one which is more interdisciplinary. And you have seen here, for instance, the University of Lisbon, we have one periodic table in the floor, probably we have met this, and they make a, a party in, the, uh, in February, somewhere in February, but it was an, a celebration everywhere in Portugal, in, at least in the beginning of the year, this was in Porto, before City, City Hall, and I have learned that also it was in Ciencia Viva, uh, in April probably, that I was not aware. 29th of January. Oh, I'm not... 18 towns, okay. I, 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 was, I was abroad, I was not here, but I've seen that was happening, exactly. Yes, so this is a celebration here, so I'm starting with the light things. And, uh, and of course, this is a little beginning, the beginning because we also in Cici Viva, there is in the tiles, okay, a periodic table in tiles. There is, it was this uh, drama, this in theater plays. I offer you oh. an original manuscript of the. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so it was, I have not, it was performed here around Lisbon in Almada, in Quimbo, in Porto. I miss it, but uh, I, think, I hope that we'll come back, this, this piece. And here is, uh, I have not been there, but this is a photograph that was in El Pais. Exactly the beginning of this session was this uh, section of the ICMAT uh, web page, Cafe and Theorems, that is related to, to the, this article, Mathematics al Redor la Tabla Periodica, that was written by Antonio Corbin, I read. It was published in January this year in El Pais. And of course, these are the explanation for the general, uh, for uh, a newspaper, but it was an interesting uh, article that called my attention, not only my attention, and of course, I just, uh, uh, it's in Spanish, but of course, all you can read if you have some time. And of course, this is the quantum mechanic approach. And of course, uh, it is related to this, uh, the quantic model of the atom. And uh, uh, you have uh, more um, on this uh, in the Antonio talk at end. And of course, but just a small introduction and where first mathematics encounters the periodic table is in quantum mechanics, I believe. And uh, of course, this goes back from the beginning of the century, or at least uh, with work of, uh, of the foundation of quantum mechanics of von Neumann in particular. And in fact, uh, you, see, you can see here in Schrodinger equation first, of course. First, there is the, the, the Schrodinger equation, where psi is the wave function. And uh, this is the Schrodinger equation. Everybody knows the Schrodinger equation. But this is a nice quote that I found from one well known mathematician, Stone, that was one of the the founders also, the subject of mathematics that was originated very much, not completely, but not but the functional analysis that was motivated by quantum mechanics in particular in the, in the first half of the 20th century. And in fact, around the 20s or the 30s, the, big, the von Neumann was one of the main um, mathematicians that contributed to 
to, to the operator theory that is related to, to quantum mechanics. And uh, so I, I just have here some quotation that maybe you can read afterward because there is a short time. Uh, first from Stone and another one from, from Toshio, uh, Toshio Kato uh, that is related to exactly this equation that I presume is the basis of your talk, probably, the eigenvalue equation associated to Schrodinger, where this is naturally the Hamiltonian, and this is related to self-adjoint operators, which is an important uh, chapter of functional analysis and is the basis of uh, mathematical um, theory for the, the quantum mechanics, which is, of course, one of the first aspect, or the first encounter of the periodic table uh, with mathematics. And in fact, uh, a priori, if you just read this uh, interesting article in El País, there is only this aspect. But then I start to dig, and nowadays you can dig in the internet, you can find a lot of things that you could not even imagine that exist. And I've been learning that, in fact, there are many more aspects that are not in my field, so that's why I was not completely aware of them until I start with this uh, uh, challenge. And I found this book, and this book is not a very popular book. I don't know if you... I, I, finally, I succeed our library to buy this book because it was very difficult. I saw this book. It is not in the internet. I could not find some articles. They are in the internet. But this book that was published already in uh, 2006, so it's not so young, but this is an interesting book. And in fact, you have here a lot of authors. They are mainly uh, theoretical chemists, uh, theoretical physicists, some, some applied mathematicians, but uh, not, very, not coming from mathematics, coming from uh, other sciences. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because there are several chapters which present some aspects, some, some application of some mathematical uh, theories, some mathematical results, areas into the periodic table that goes from the, the topology, the information theory, uh, and of course, group theory. And there are also naturally some related to quantum mechanics, but not much here. In this book, there is not much toward quantum mechanics. There are some information, but basically on algebra, there are, and you see, I, sh I shall now present a little bit because my idea is just to give an overview of these topics without going very deeply because I don't, not, not only I don't have the time, it should not be not appropriate to do it here. So, for instance, the first article of the one, one of the one of the editors, which is one of the authors, he, he raised the, the issue of the ultimate state of periodic type. So we have seen that he started with six to one elements, and in fact he has an interesting historical uh, review with the, say the, the phosphorus was the one apparently the only one that was isolated in 17th century. Then in 18th century, there are already several elements here already. You can see the oxygen, the hydrogen, all these basic uh, elements. And then in 19th century, there are a lot more. And then uh, 20, OK, this is all the list. Uh, I don't know, I did not count them. But interesting is the, the graph with respect to, to the years. You see here is the, uh, exactly 17th century, uh, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, and now 20th century. Okay, now we are 20, 21st century already, but as you know, there are basically the synthetic elements that are coming, coming out now. In any case, this uh, is an interesting uh, historical uh, uh, overview, but raise another question about the predictions. So more elements are being found or being uh, put together uh, synthetically, but in any case, there, this, uh, I, I found another, in this article, in the published already in another book recently, about the, the, uh, not only the history of the predictions, uh, wh what could be, uh, how many elements, in fact, could exist. And there are a history of all these predictions that go after Mendeleev, uh, starting with the, the limit, Z limit, as he called it. And you can see that it's oscillated a lot. During the uh, 19th, 20th century, there are many predictions after the quantum mechanics starts to and the thousands, but uh, under the thousands, there are all these authors, Prince of Bohr, that claims under the thousands in 22, what that means. And of course, there are many, Sommerfeld's 137 in 24, which is closer to the last number. Last number is uh, Brodzinski and Skalski, probably this is same thing for the chemists, for me it was just new names, that put the limit nowadays at 126. But of course, these are results of several 
chemical theories, I presume, or physical theories. I don't know which one is more reliable. So this is the prediction about the upper limit of the periodic table, which is, uh, uh, of course, some predictions have been already passed, clearly, okay, because now we have 118 already known. And of course, this uh, is uh, 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 probably a challenge. I don't know if mathematics can help or not to, to somehow give a more precise estimate for this Z limit, for this limit, if it's important. I'm not sure how important this is for chemistry, but this is for you to, to answer. In any case, there are other two aspects. Now, this is the topological study of periodic system. This is, is, a, is an interesting uh, chapter also in this, in this book that, uh, in fact, um, discusses a little bit uh, the proximity, proximity neighborhood of the, the elements. So it likes to use a kind of uh, uh, finite uh, set uh, topology in order to, to help the classification of the elements. And, and he claim, they, claim, they claim, after some uh, analysis that is based uh, in cluster analysis, though, so they have these elements, they put some, they do some cluster analysis with some known methods, mathematical methods, and then they try to, to classify uh, to make a basis for the topology. And they give examples, several examples. Uh, in particular, probably the most relevant were probably the, the classification because there are no, uh, as far as I, 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 I read, there are, no, uh, there are several ways to classify the metallic, non-metallic, semi-metallic. Uh, these are the, the, uh, these are the, the calcogen elements. And what's it's interesting that they use this kind of uh, assembling the, the elements in, in groups or in, 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 in classes somehow, according to some properties, chemical properties, of course, uh, in order to, to uh, then to apply in finite sets. So these are the oxygen, etc., etc. They have all this. This is the, the G, the set, what is the, 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 uh, the calcogen, calcogen elements. And then they, they make the closure which are, are in, in, the, in, the, in the boundary. They, the drive set, this is the domain which are the, uh, the limit points, and also the boundary. And they, they put here in this, uh, in this geography of the periodic table uh, of the characterization of uh, how they are close to each other. So this is a topological classification in finite sets by groups. Uh, well, if this is very relevant or not, the authors, they claim they may be relevant to classif classify in particular, for instance, the semi-metals, because they uh, use this uh, semi-metal classification by this chemist Clem, in the 1950s, uh, that uh, basically uh, they, they apply this technique and they, they, they found some, some uh, way to classify, the, in this case, the semi-metals. And in fact, their conclusions, uh, this is the paper, the classification of Clem they, 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 they use, they, in fact, uh, they are, of course, the summary is written by the authors. Basically, uh, what I found more relevant is uh, the, this approach for the, um, uh, since they, they claim there is no rigorous definition on several authors by the, the classification of elements, metals, no metals, uh, they use this uh, topological approach to somehow justify the claim classification to metals, metametals, mean metals, and no metals. And maybe this is relevant for the, for, for the chemistry, I don't know. So this is an example how topological methods can be, uh, or have been used, relatively recent, because this is a recent contribution. Then there are also this interesting approach by this, uh, 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 now working in the United States, this B Bulgarian origin bone chef, I don't know if you which is now in the part of mathematics, Center of Studies of Biological Complexity in Virginia, about periodicity of chemical elements and nucleates, information theoretical analysis. So here he's using basically, well, I'm not going into details, but he's using the channels information theory to <coughs> exactly using the information that the periodical table and all of the, the chemical elements try to, 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 to put the, the group of elements and to be able, and they claim, he claims that in fact was able to predict in some properties in some, uh, in some, uh, well, the transact, uh, need the elements in this range. But in any case, uh, basically, he uses the, the, inf the, the techniques of the information theory of Shannon and they have, <coughs> sorry, uh, using the information theory to describe periodicity of the chemical elements. 
And in fact, uh, after some, uh, ex uh, this is a technical uh, article, not very, uh, I mean, need some time to invest and know a little bit of information theory and chemistry mainly. But basically, this is probably the, the uh, work that goes back by this author uh, to the 1780. Where, and, uh, uh, and he found himself some, um, uh, some relevant conclusions. He claims that there are some 23 years later, we found data for 41 synthesized nucleids, and our predictions were confirmed with standard deviation, etc., etc. I could not confirm if this is true or not, but the author claims that he has used the information theory to get new information for the, the tables. Uh, finally, uh, the three last chapters, 10, 11, and 12, they are all on group theory. And of course, uh, you know what is group theory, and you know that this is related to the symmetries. I have not much time to describe. Basically, the three authors, some probably this is a physicist uh, from Mexico, and it, it, goes, it dates back to these words of uh, Vladimir Fock, the relevance of the group theory for the periodic system. And it, it is a kind of introdut introductory article that makes, um, and it goes back to the quantum mechanics, of course. It goes back to the quantum. And, uh, <coughs> and in fact, uh, this is the first uh, chapter on group theory. In fact, there are two more. This is from the Russian school, Dostrovsky, from, uh, also from the Institute of Physics in St. Petersburg, that uh, gave uh, an application of the group theory to the periodic elements with several conclusions. But I have no time now to go into details. But of course, I, I have, uh, I have a, now we have in our library this book. So if you are interested, you can <laughs> just have it and read it by yourself. I also have some PDFs on it. But about symmetry and breaking the symmetry, I found very recently that, in fact, uh, it was recently uh, uh, a thesis uh, uh, in, the, in the math department uh, of uh, Catholic University in Leuven, in, in Belgium, that it was a, th a thesis, a PhD thesis, about symmetry and symmetry breaking on periodic table, because uh, maybe symmetry is too, is too, too, it's too much for the periodic table. There are some symmetries, but there are also lots of breaking symmetries. And he, he writes a very, a very long, a very long uh, uh, thesis. It's available on the web. But it's interesting because, uh, well, probably he's not a mathematician because I have not checked, he did not publish, to my knowledge, any paper on any mathematical journal, not even in chemical journal. I could not find if it was some consequences. Uh, uh, this Peter Thyssen apparently now is working in a group of uh, philosophy of science. But this thesis is very long and is, uh, uh, the, and is even the, the collection of information it is very, very interesting in my opinion. And he has a very nice uh, uh, phrase of Pierre Curie. C'est la dissymétrie qui crée le phénomène. So this is exactly playing and breaking the symmetry brings uh, uh, also the phenomenon in this case. And uh, so this is concerning this. And very recently, because I don't want to extend too much, recently uh, I found an article uh, just published this year in Proceedings of Royal Society A on the formal structure of periodic system of elements. And this is related a little bit to, to the one of the approaches that was in that book, but because in fact, this Restrec was one of the co-authors of that topological paper. But this Restrepo now is in Leipzig, in the Mathematical Institute of Leipzig, the, the Mathematics for Science. It's an ERCOM center as well. <laughs> so he's doing, probably he's coming, he's Colombian, coming uh, from chemistry, but now he's working in applied mathematics. And this is a very, very interesting article for the periodic system, not periodic table. There is a distinction. I will go back to that later. And in fact, this article describes this distinction. But where he used ordered hypergraphs. So he's using uh, graph theory, trying to uh, characterize the structure of the periodic table. And uh, well, I could not find prediction. I have no time to read very deeply this, this paper. It's not very difficult to read, but it's uh, on graph theory, or a generalization of graph, because hypergraphs are, are structures. In fact, in this cover is this, uh, this, this hypergraph. I can show you later. This is here. So it puts together the elements with these connections these uh, edges. So you have the edges, you have a hypergraph because uh, uh, each uh, edge can connect more than just two elements. So in fact, this is a very complex uh, mathematical structure that is uh, exactly, um, well, it's called the hypergraph. And in fact, it's interesting because um, 
it, it tries to make a formali mathematical formalization of the formal structure of the periodical system. And in fact, there is a distinction. While they, this is the, the, the themselves, the periodical system of chemical elements is a structure resulting from considering the order and similarity of chemical elements. Okay? So this is the periodic system is the structure. But on the other hand, periodic table is the mapping of periodic system in another place. So it's basically an, a bi-dimensional space. So the periodic table is restricted to the two dimensions, while the, the periodic system can have higher dimension. In fact, in that book that I just showed you, uh, in that book there is also one chapter by some Japanese author that uh, has a three-dimensional periodic table. So they are tentatives to, to make pluridimensional periodic tables, but they did not want to show that because they could not evaluate if they were not speculative and all relevant for chemistry is that higher dimensions periodical tables. But why not? I mean, you can think about the different dimensions in periodic tables, not only two, which is now the current situation, because in fact it's very, very, very complex, the, the possible links between the elements and the properties. Okay, so uh, in fact, was I, I also, so this is a not very long paper, uh, and they have this picture which is the, the main the main achievement in this paper, this, uh, this hypergraph relating uh, this. In fact, there was some public uh, article, some, some scientific uh, uh, newsletter saying that this was a new, a new periodic table. I think it's too much to call this a new periodic table, but in a certain sense it's a new description with hypergraphs. But in fact, what is interesting in their setting is that they make a precise definition of Mendelevian periodic system. So let E be a set of chemical elements. Let Z the atomic number. This is a, the order relation by, 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 by Z, by, by, by the atomic number. P the properties of the elements. So P is a family of properties. CP a classification by P. Then by definition, Mendelevian periodic system is the ordered uh, partition. So this is triple, the set, the order relation by Z, the atomic number, and this classification given by the properties. So this is the mathematical <laughs> framework for this hypergraph. And, uh, and of course, they have some description of the figure, but uh, this paper is available. And in fact, also the, the conclusions are somehow interesting because uh, they, they claim that they have formalized and generalized periodic system as a set in those system simulatory classes. So these are the crucial that makes these edges to make hypergraph. Those elements hold an order relation. So they are order in this mathematical sense, of course, but of course always by, by the atomic number. And the structure uh, is able to accommodate new chemical elements. That's why, of course, now we are, now the organism is the, the, the highest number on 11. 118, but of course uh, this structure allows empty spaces to be filled by the chemists. So that's why how how far can we go to the uh, to uh, in the periodic table uh, in the in the atomic number. Okay, so in a certain sense they claim that this results uh, game a generalization network in hypergraphs and. Uh, this is the last paper I found this year. Probably there are more. I could not find everything. But basically, this was the last thing. And now, if you allow me, probably some of you already have seen this, but this is a remarkable perspective from another mathematician. So you have seen my, my perspective as a mathematician for the periodic table. But now is uh, Sorry, I need to... Uh, how can I start the... Tom Lehr was a mathematician and a musician. Here's a song I always get requests for, but I can't understand for the life of me why. Um, it's uh, simply the names of the chemical elements set to a Hilbert Sullivan tune. I think the only reason I do is to see if I still can try it. Thank you. 
so uh, those of you who are taking notes can write it down in your program. There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and manganese and reckonine and lithium and magnesium and viscosium and scandium and cerium and cesium and lead, praseodymium and platinum and plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium, tantalum, dignesium, titanium, tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. There's gold and californium and fermium and berkelium and also metallium, einsteinium, nobelium and argon, krypton, yevry, nothing, nothing, and rhodium and chloric, copper, cobalt, copper, tungsten, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to Harvard. And there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. This is a little perspective from mathematician. <laughs> You have to stand for a, just a moment to ask if anybody would like to ask questions. If you want. Of course, I shall try to answer as much as I am able. I will ask you one. OK. About uh, applying information theory to the atomic elements, because I couldn't get the point. <laughs> what, what, what property of the element is he going to use to try to attach it uh, it's to a bit information. It's a bit technical. I avoid that. I mean, he has some graphs, he has some treatments, some logarithms, some uh, measures, and then uh, it brings some conclusions. I can give you the PDF and then... I'd like to. Uh, I no, I'm not prepared to answer that question <laughs> because it's a bit too technical. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so we had a first look at the per periodic table from a mathematician's point of view. Many mathematicians' point of view. Yes, Thank you very much. Yes. Now I'll ask the second speaker, which is, which is Manuel Gagnes. That's a difficult one. Uh, the power of, of systematization. Yeah. This is something that mathematicians love. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a big honor for, for us, for Otina and myself, to be here today just to make this presentation. Obrigadissimo. <coughs> oh, empezamos. Well, uh, even if the, we are celebrating the 150 years of the first periodic table, uh, my message is that it is still a living object with many surprises yet to come. And there are still many things that we do not understand perfectly well in the distribution of the elements in nature, their presence and everything. Well, the first revolution of Mendeleev table was systematization, was the first time. Actually, the criterion was pure empiricism. And he realized that when he ordered the elements uh, using the atomic uh, masses, they share common chemical properties. Why this question had no answer at that moment it was just an empirical fact. An empirical fact that in the words of Niels Bohr was fundamental. Was the periodic table was the guiding star for the exploration of the fields in chemistry and physics I think, and is still in that sense a guiding star. But there were some, some sh shadows in that case because uh, the order was not completely satisfactory. There were couples that were reversed in the presence of the periodic table when you used the mass. But the positive point that the, there were some elements at that time completely unknown, ecaboron, scandium, ecaluminium, gallium, ecamanganese, tignexium, and ecansilicon germanium, that were discovered later on exactly in the same position and exactly with the properties predicted by the table of periodic. But the final version of the table was achieved thanks to this guy, the British Henry Mosley, at the beginning of the 20th century and was the first mathematical equation that described the periodic table. When he realized that the light emitted by the elements were directly related with some number, an integer number, an integer number that was the number of the protons in the nuclei, the atomic number, but still it was not evident why the properties of the light emitted by the were directly related with the number of the protons. The first explanation came from mathematics in the 20s, but this was not an easy way. 
any attempt to use mathematical methods to study chemistry issues must be considered deeply rational and contrary to the spirit of chemistry. If mathematical analysis ever comes to play a prominent role in chemistry, an aberration that is happily almost impossible, it will be the time for a rapid and general degeneration of science. And that was published in the 18th century. But not everybody, fortunately, thought the same. And, and, and at the same time, Quidlet wrote, the more the physical science progress, the more they tend to enter into the, doma the domain of mathematics which is like this, a center toward which everything converges. We can judge the degree of perfection achieved by a science by the easy with which it can be subjected to calculation. And that is indeed the case, at least what I believe, <laughs> because I am a quantum chemist. Well, the first real revolution was back in, in 1925 when Schrodinger in Villa da Rosa, Christmas holidays with his mistress, uh, apparently, his mistress was able just to, you know, to motivate him just to write the equation, but nobody knows what uh, the personality of this woman, but probably was behind the equation, was able just to, to solve the, f the equation for the uh, one electron system, the hydrogen atom, and reach to an expression that was a revolution in chemistry, because it appeared an in integer number in the equation that was the quantization of the levels. But the difference was, this was uh, first introduced by Bohr, but in an empirical, empirical way, assuming that the quantization exists. But this, there, there was no a priori systems here. That's the, the result of solving the equation, in such a way that the levels in the hydrogen light systems were quantized, and therefore the, we could explain perfectly well and exactly the experimental frequencies at which appear the different series of the emission of hydrogen light systems was the first mathematical equation that precisely explained all those experimental data. But there is always a but. The problem was when you try to generalize this equation for two electron systems, helium, because this equation is separable in the three coordinates of the electron. But when you have two electrons, you have an additional term in the, in the potential energy uh, interaction. It's the, the interaction, the repulsion between electron one and electron two that depends simultaneously of the coordinates of the two electrons. So the equation is not se separable. The equation cannot be solved. Cannot. And the only way is assuming that the electrons are independent particles, that they do not repel each other, at least when you form, the, you look for the solution. In that case, the mathematical solution for helium is 1s squared, the product of the, the, the function that describes electron 1 times the function that describes electron 2, and the same for beryllium or for lithium and beryllium and things like that. The success was so big that even nowadays a lot of people thinks that 1s square is the true electronic configuration of helium. Even many chemists, many chemists even today, without noticing that with this wave function, you only get 92% of the total energy of the system. The approximation is indeed very good, but is still an approximation. So we are dealing with an approximation, whatever we try to look at any chemical system around the world. So, that is reality. Well, but even today, the placement of the elements in the periodic table is not so clear, start, starting for, for hy in, with hydrogen. Because in hydrogen, the Coulomb field is created just by, by one proton over one electron. Then when you form FH, hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen is well located above lithium, because it has a positive charge. The, pro the, the electron moves to the fluorine atom. Ah, but when you bind hydrogen to lithium, what you have is a lithium hydride, H minus, and it should be above fluorine atom and not above lithium. So, hydrogen, you know, is an element that could be at the right or at the left of the periodic table. But the same happens when you arrive to helium. Helium should be here above beryllium. But the UPAC decided to put it 
above nil because you can never form a helium molecule according to the quantum mechanics and according to reality. The helium two molecules do not exist. Well, they exist if you start an electron. But the question was that when, when the UPAC decided that, the beryllium is, does this molecule exist? Well, the answer was rich this century. Well, because the first theoretical studies on beryllium predicted that beryllium 2 was less stable than two beryllium atoms, were in the 60s and the 70s. And only at the end of the 70s there was a paper by Bartlett uh, uh, finding that was a very weakly bound system. And f the first full CI calculations published in, in 1983 showed that the ground state uh, was stable, but with a dissociation energy extremely small, less than one kilocalorie per mole. Well, in 2009, 2009, already 21st century, beryllium-2 was detected experimentally. And only just yesterday, in a paper published in 2014, Stefano and co-workers were able to explain why the, the bomb was so, so weak. Because here you have a bonding orbital and the normal uh, theory put two electrons here. So you have two electrons bonding, two electrons antibonding, no bond. But when you do very precise calculations, what you get here is two electrons, here only 1.7, and the other 0.3 electrons are in a bonding orbital that make beryllium 2 a very weak bound but bound molecule. Well, one, the first revolution was then Schrodinger equation. The second revolution was in the 70s, when people realized that the two electrons are particles that have charge, therefore they have magnetic properties, and the question is that the interaction between uh, magnets is very, very weak, because it's inversely proportional to the square of the, of the speed of light. So it's completely negligible. Well, that is true for lithium, that is true for carbon, but it's not true for a heavy atom like gold, for instance. And actually, when you calculate without excluding the relativistic effects, the, the ionization potential or the electron affinity of gold, you get values that are completely different from the experimental ones. And only when you introduce relativistic effects, when you take into account that uh, the, the electrons not only repel each other, but they have magnetic interactions, then you are able to get ionization potentials and electron affinities very close to the experimental values. But even more, you can explain why gold is inert, do not react practically with anything. Even you can explain why gold is yellow, <laughs> has no color, because those are consequences of this relativistic effect that is, you know, a question of precision in the calculations you do on the system. But the precision of our mathematical tools have increased a lot in the last decades. And then some people decided to explore gold again, but not when you have millions and millions of atoms making a huge crystal. We know that that gold, the, main, the, the one used in this, <laughs> in this rings, is inert. But what happens if you look at a gold molecule, just two atoms of gold? Well, that is the, electrost the molecular electrostatic potential around this, this system, around this system. And this indicates that this guy interacts strongly with electrons or negative particles in these streams or in those streams, sorry, with, with positive charges. Well, that indicates that this is, should be quite reactive, as reactive as chlorine molecule. And chlorine molecule is known for, for centuries that it's a very reactive system. Well, gold molecules are as reactive as chlorine molecules. So when you reduce your huge crystal just to a couple of atoms bound together, you get a new molecule that is as reactive as most reactive molecules in the periodic system. But uh, uh, Torbring, 
paper in 2017, decided just to study not only the, the molecule but clusters of gold, and all these clusters of gold shows points of high reactivity. And actually, now, now, nowadays, there are many labs that use these clusters of gold just to enhance the reactivity of other systems in chemistry. Gold, that was the stable metal in all the civilizations, is a, terri a terrific catalyst, uh, uh, catalyst in many reactions. Well, but the precision is also important for molecules. Uh, to study, for instance, a simple molecule, oxygen in the air, you, you can use normally in quantum chemistry two different theories, valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. In the valence bond theory, they organize the electrons by, by pairs. But in, mole in molecular orbital theory, this restriction is not imposed. And when you obtain the best mathematical function that describes the oxygen that we breathe, you get the, that the electrons are organized in pairs except the highest two because they are two energy levels that are exactly the same. And therefore, the electrons, in order to avoid the repulsion between them, one of them is seated in one of the orbitals, and the other then is seated in the other orbitals. But then, since they have an intrinsic magnetic moment, the conclusion is that the ground state of oxygen should be what we call the chemistry a triplet, because it has a spin one, and should be a permanent magnet. A permanent magnet? So you breathe, we breathe a magnet? Well. This is an experiment carried out by a colleague. He took liquid air, separated nitrogen from oxygen. Now he's, he's dropping nitrogen on a, on a magnet. Nothing happened. The nitrogen fell down. Here they have oxygen, liquid oxygen, and he's dropped it in the magnet. And what happened? That the oxygen is trapped between the poles of the magnet. So the prediction of the theory is that oxygen, the oxygen we breathe is a magnet. By the way, you know, the hemoglobin has iron and the magnetic property of oxygen is something not irrelevant even for the oxygen we breathe. Well, but the singlet oxygen do exist, but it's an excited state of the oxygen molecule. And very recently, people find that you can generate, instead of triple oxygen, that is the oxygen we breathe, singlet oxygen, and the singlet oxygen is toxic for, for, for cells. And then the, the, the therapy is you have a patient with a tumor, you inject a photosynthesizer, hmm? and then with light, the photosynthesizer makes a reaction in which Singular oxygen is produced, and then our, our uh, guy is happy because got rid of that tumor. So we read, we read a magnet, but the singlet corresponding that, that is not a magnet is extremely toxic for the molecules. The only problem is just to locate that uh, toxicity in the molecules that are uh, cancerigen, uh, cancerigen. Well. But there are other singularities in the periodic table that are not related with relativistic effects. For instance, water is liquid. That is obvious for everybody. But when you study chemistry, you think, and why is liquid? Why is liquid? It's a hydride of the first row. And you start the first row in lithium, and you finish in FH, and all the hydrides, all of them, are gases. Only water is liquid. But water is liquid, and SH2, that is in the same group, is not liquid, it's a gas. And according to the criteria normally used in physics and chemistry, since SH2 has a mass larger than the mass of water, because sulfur is larger than oxygen, should be also a liquid. If water is a liquid, SH2 for his uh, larger mass should be also liquid. But SH2 is not liquid. It's a gas. But there is something else. 
There is something else is that water ma macroscopically is neither acidic or basic. It's the paradigm of neutrality. Okay? Well, that is okay. Nothing strange. The problem was that around the 70s, chemists, chemists were able to measure accurately the basicity and the acidity of individual molecules. And of course, water was a clear target. So, they measured the basicity of the water molecule and found these values, is 190 kilojoules per mole. But when they measured the acidity, the value of acidity was not at all the same value of the basicity. Not at all. And then the question was, so, the, a, a, an isolated water molecule is much more basic than acidic. But the water we drink is neither basic nor acidic. So, how we can explain that? How water molecule, water, eh, liquid water is neutral if the molecules have, are much more basic than acidic? So the question is, do we become water molecules different if they interact with each other? The answer is yes. If you now use again mathematics to study what happens with when two mo water molecules interact, you find that the most stable structure of the dimer is this one, in which one of the water molecules acts as a proton donor with respect to the other water molecule. So this water molecule is not identical to that water molecule. And actually, this water molecule has two bonds totally different. One of them is larger than the other one because the proton attached to this oxygen is attracted by the oxygen of the second water molecule. That is the structure predicted by theory, by mathematics of water molecule, and confirmed by the experiments carry out in the gas phase. But the consequence is terrific because this means that this water molecule is more basic than an isolated water molecule. Why? Because this water molecule is just donating this proton to this water molecule. So is able to attract better than before than that was isolated another proton molecule. Or another proton. And this is just the, the, the contrary. This is more acidic because this water molecule is already attracting an H plus and therefore is able to better donate an H plus. Then what happened when you try to obtain the trimer of water? Well, the trimer of water is cyclic. Because in this way, this guy profits that is a better proton, proton acceptor, but this one a, 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 be, a, is a better proton donor. So this interaction is stronger. So the three hydrogen bonds, that is the name of these interactions, that you find in the trimer are stronger than the single one you have in the dimer. So the trimer is not a linear structure, it's a cyclic structure. But this result has and a very important consequence, because that happened with the trimer, and that happened, the, the cooperativity, but happens also with the pentamer, with the octamer, with the decamer, in such a way that when you have water and you start decreasing the temperature and therefore the mobility of the molecules, they associate each other, making this kind of structures. They are not very compact like, like in normal liquid. When you have a liquid and you, dis, you decrease the temperature and you get the solid, the density of your, liquid, of your system increases because the distance between the molecules that form the liquid are smaller and smaller. But in water, does not happen because you are forming this kind of cycles. What is the consequence of that? That when you, it freezes, it makes beautiful crystals but more important than that, the density is smaller than in the liquid phase. And that is not a trivial question. Makes our planet a marvelous place because our planet will be completely different if water starts freezing in the, in the deep of the ocean and not in the top of the ocean. Well, but not only water differs from H2, Carbon, carbon and silicon are in the same group. They should have the same kind of 
chemistry and properties and things like that. But just to put an example, one very well-known uh, hydrocarbon is acetylene, and you have only two carbon atoms and two hydrogen atoms. But then the problem is, what happens if you have instead of carbon silicon? Well, that structure does not exist. And people start saying, okay, what is the structure of that such a system? Well, there are three structures, but any of them is this one. Those are calculations carried out in 2004, and the most recent results, experimental results, show that these two structures are very close in energy, are the only one observable experimentally. So, what is the conclusion of the precision in, all this, in, in this particular case? The conclusion is very, very important. Is the first row of the periodic table is a singularity. When you look at the first row of the periodic table, it is true that lithium, grosso modo, behaves like sodium, potassium, and things like that. That beryllium, grosso modo, behaves like magnesium. Oxygen, grosso modo, behaves like sulfur. Carbon, grosso modo, behaves like, like, uh, like silicon. But there is a huge difference. Silicon behaves very much like, like germanium, and, and magnesium behaves very much as calcium. But beryllium does not behave very much as magnesium, oxygen does not behave very much as, as sulfur, carbon does not behave very much as silicon. Well, my before last uh, slide was already shown in this, in this table. That is a production of this year, because it's this distorted periodic table in which you take into account the abundance of the elements in nature, and therefore you have a lot of hydrogen, a lot of oxygen, but very few of these, of these other elements, and that is important because some of them have important technological applications, hmm? and if we get rid of them, then we can have serious <laughs> problems. But perhaps, just to finish, it's all, all, also useful just to make marketing of their own periodic table. And that is one of the portraits of uh, Chemistry European Journal. You see, International Year of the Periodic Table. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have had most interesting, and for me, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so many things I didn't know. I would say, hardly is there anybody who would like to ask questions to our speaker? Because I'm sure you, you have questions in your mind. <laughs> well, it can be later oh, on. If, if, if <laughs> <laughs> no one is, I mean, everybody was, you know, really, you know, astonished. I mean, my, my thoughts are yet confused. <laughs> <laughs> my, <laughs> so many things. My only, my only challenge was just to transmit my, my ideas in half an hour. I wasn't really concerned I, about that. It was fantastic <laughs> because uh, for, for an electrical engineer, this is almost everything new. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank that you that told me that s silicon and germanium are uh, cousins. So we, can, we can both, silicon and germanium are cousins. Yes, we can yes, yes. Things with silicon what, what, germanium. What, it, what is true is that... From the electrical point of view, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Micro but when, carbon, you, when, when, you reach, but when you reach the period of gold... It'll be then? interesting. <laughs> Quite interesting things that you can do with carbon. Uh, with carbon, yes, particularly yeah. with diamond. Uh, okay, so we are going now. Thank you very much again for your fantastic lecture. And let's uh, go on to the Adlin Galvan out. I could speak in Portuguese, <laughs> but never mind. Adlin, go on. I think that is the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much for your kind introduction. And before I start, if you allow me, I would just like to make a couple of remarks. One of them is regarding this history of the periodic table that was presented by Professor Francisco. And uh, just to remind you that next Tuesday, so four days from now, uh, Pavillon de Cuvignocimento will hold an exhibition about the history of periodic table that was developed in Fábrica de Ciência in Aveiro by Professor Isabel Malaquias, coordinated by Professor Isabel Malaquias 
the exhibition has been moving around the different towns in Portugal and from next to Tuesday to the end of the year it will be in Lisbon so it will be an opportunity to go to Pavilhão de Conhecimento and see that exhibition I will be there, I haven't seen it yet so you are all invited to be there the rector of Aveiro University will be there and many other important people to launch the exhibition in Lisbon now I also want to make a remark for the previous speaker one interesting thing about second row elements and third row elements, not only carbon, but all the elements, one huge difference is second row elements can make double and triple bonds because atoms are close together. So you can have side coalescence of orbitals. In the third row line of periodic table, Bohr predicted the atomic radius is nine times bigger than in the first row. So nine times bigger means one atom is here, the other atom is there. You can make, cannot make side coalescence of orbitals, so you just have single bonds. So if you have double and triple bonds, you can make chemistry at low temperatures, like 37 degrees centigrade. So you can make life. So carbon, oxygen, nitrogen are elements of life. You can, because you can make chemistry at very low temperatures. If you are in third row, you can just have single bonds. Single bonds are very difficult to break. It's like bad cholesterol. You can only make <laughs> things that make strokes or things like that. So minerals are in third row, aluminates, phosphates, silicates, etc., etc. And carbon is a paradigm because it can have a structure like germanium or silicium, diamond. It's just a, a, a bigger gap, but can also make graphite, with, which is a conductor, because it has double bonds. Okay? So its main difference, second row, life, third row, minerals, and the question is size matters. If I have the two atoms together, I can make double thick bonds. If I have the atoms far apart, I can just make single bonds. That's just size, nothing else. Okay? And now I'm going to talk about uh, that, trying to answer these questions. Are atoms bricks of molecules? And before passing to the first slide, I want to give you the idea what I want to tell you. Imagine a cake. Okay? I'm cooking a cake and I put some sugar on top of the cake. When I give you the cake, you can still recognize sugar as an ingredient of that cake. But what happens with sugar that I put on the dough? Is it still sugar when you eat it? You can recognize probably eggs by the color, some sweetness by the taste. Probably you can guess there is flour, but you cannot see flour or sugar or eggs or milk or whatever, because they are all mixed together. And that is something that I wonder. I know that I make molecules from atoms, but after, after I make the molecules, can I still recognize atoms there? Are atom molecules really made of atoms? Okay? So that's the question I, I will try to answer. And I will try to answer that because for me that I am a chemist, not a physicist or a mathematician, uh, I'm interested in the electronic cloud, the outskirts of the molecule. Okay? Chemists are the architects of the electronic cloud. Physicists are worried about nuclei. For me, nuclei is just an artifact. I don't worry about nuclei. I, I use nuclei like architects use iron bars inside concrete. But what I'm worried about as a user is the cement that creates the surface where I can put these tiles, not the iron bars inside that all the structure. To me, nuclei all the structure of molecules to give it shape but I'm worried about function, and function is on the outskirts of the molecule. That those outskirts are still resemble atoms. That's the, the question I want to ask and to try to find some answers using mathematics. Okay? And so I can move on to the... Oops. Okay. And I will start with Schrodinger equation, because I want to answer this question by design. I want to be able to predict the properties of molecules before I synthesize them. For instance, if I, if I want to look to a new drug, I, want to, I do not want to go to the lab and test 1,000 molecules because that costs a lot of money. I want to select like 20 or 10 that are the most promising ones. I want to find function for molecules from design. So I need mathematical methods to predict properties. And what I have, oops, sorry, is just this st 
stressing these distribution functions that come from quantum mechanics, which are something odd for chemists. Quant you know, distribution functions, what is that? I cannot measure that. Okay? And then I have some operators that operate on those functions to produce the variables that I can measure in the lab. So, and the, the, the operators have some things, things like populations, kinetic energy, and the potential operator that includes like the repulsion, repulsion between electrons, attraction between nuclei and electrons, lots of terms. And usually I access my properties through a functional uh, which relates the operator and that operates in my distribution function. We call it orbital sometimes, but it's a distrib statistical distribution function. And this functional gives me the energy. And that's one thing that I like to show in the next slides because this equation can tell you how chemists apply mathematics to solve their problems. And the way mathematics, uh, chemists use mathematics to solve their problems is started with a set of numbers. This set of numbers can be positions in space from nuclei and electrons in time. It's a set of numbers. Then we have functions. What are functions? Functions just do one thing. They transform a set of numbers in a different set of numbers. So I transform positions in space in a distribution function probability. So I start guessing a distribution function. And you will see that's where we always start is by guessing the wave function. Without even solving the equation, we always go from the end to the beginning. We start in the end. We guess. I know the answer, so I say the wave function is, is this one. I invent one. And how do I invent one? I said, if everything is made from periodic table, I just do linear combinations of the orbitals, that the atoms that make molecule. I expand my wave function in, in, in a linear combination of atomic wave functions. Okay? So I pick up a set of numbers, I use functions to create a new set of numbers. Then I have operators, the kinetic energy op operator, the potential operator. What do operators do? It just transforms functions in other functions. So an, uh, a function transforms a number in another number, and an operator transforms a function in another function. That's wh what I have seen here. Okay? I have an operator that operates in a function to produce another function. Okay? And then I have functionals. A functional transformates a function into a number. And that number is the thing that I, I can measure in my lab. Either the energy, the momentum, the dipole moment, whatever. So I start with numbers. Functions transform these numbers into another numbers, which are distribution functions. I use operators to transform these functions into another functions. And functionals, which is this thing here, transform functions into numbers, numbers that ca I can measure in my lab. And so, the, then I have the problem. Mo molecules are many body systems with n nuclei and n electrons. It has been shown by the previous speaker that I cannot solve this equation. Schrodinger did it for hydrogen atom, but even helium is too complex. So, I make my first approximation, and that's where I separate physicists from chemists. I use born oppenheimer approximation. I say my nuclei are fixed. They don't move. OK, if they want to move, if, they, if this is these things they move, of course, in nuclear reactions, they move. OK, let them study them. I give that for them. Nuclei are for physicists. I use them just to create an external potential that is fixed. So like, it's like the potential of the hydrogen atom. It's just not spherical. Because nuclei are fixed, the electric field is fixed. There are no variable fields. I have a static field. So my molecular problem is the hydrogen atom problem, just an hydrogen atom that is not spherical. I have a core, which is all the nuclei where I put them where I want. And then it creates a field where the electrons will move. So it's a problem like, like an hydrogen-like problem. Okay? I reduced molecules to an hydrogen-like problem. And under this approximation, the nuclei are just mere artifacts to provide the external potential that holds and shapes the electronic cloud. And I will start with an example. Uh, ah, no, no. And before I, I, I give you an example, I will pick up hydrogen fluorine that you talked about. When I do what I did saying, I'm going to guess the solution. And my solution is a linear combination of atomic orbitals. If I have carbon and hydrogen, or 
fluorine and hydrogen, the solution will be a linear combination of the six or five orbitals of the fluorine and one s orbital of the hydrogen. But when I do that, I realized that the charge density in the hydrogen, most of them went to the bond. It's no longer there. It's no longer spherical. So I have to introduce new things. So I have to introduce extra or orbitals to add for polarization because the hydrogen atom is polarized. But there are also the interaction between the two electrons, especially because they cannot go to distance zero. The, 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 the movement is correlated. So mathematician says, OK, no problem, you use geminals. By the way, when I say orbitals, I mean eigenvalues. Uh, on, when I say geminals, is functions that describe simultaneously the behavior of two particles. An orbital describes the behavior of one particle. A geminal describes the behavior of a geminal. For instance, I could have a geminal to study the Earth around the solar system, and th that geminal would be the Earth and the Moon. Okay? I have a single function to describe the Earth and the Moon, and the, the, the two together go around the Sun. So geminals describe together uh, the correlation between two electrons. So I have strange orbitals, like 1p orbitals in the hydrogen. If I do to a traditional chemist a 1p orbital, what is a 1p orbital or a 2d orbital in carbon? It's just to polarize, to get a better shape for my wave function. So I have extra orbitals, so I no longer, I'm no longer using orbitals in that are in periodic tables. There are extra orbitals, extra functions. This thing starts expanding well beyond, when I look for accuracy, what this thing we call basis set goes well beyond the periodic table. So I no longer, I'm no longer using periodic table atoms. So it's scary because traditional chemists say periodic table atoms made up everything. It was written in, in the Euchem's periodic table, so I'm scary. Okay, so but the shape of molecules cannot be recreated from superposition of, of atomic electronic clouds. That's the problem, we have to, if I was in North, I would say Elidar. We, ha we have to, to deal with the problem the best way we could, so we cannot completely recreate molecules from the atomic clouds of atoms. So what's an atom in a molecule? What's a bond? What's an electron pair? Things that Lewis introduced in the beginning of the century. And what I will show you that we, I will say in the end, I will say in Portuguese, I think the Spanish people will understand. I will say, Lewis, volta, estás perdoado. Lewis, come back, you are forgiven. <laughs> so I will try to recover all the concepts of the beginning of the century, not from wave function, but using a mathematical tool that will bring me back from the present to the past and join both together using mathematics. Okay? So I will start to show you an example. And this is benzamide. It's a molecule I did in 1988. Okay, by neutron diffraction. I was fortunate to be in the United States, so I had access to the Rutherford, uh, uh, to the Brookhaven lab, so I had, we could do these structures at a very low temperature, from helium temperature to up to, uh, to, this, to normal temperature, so we did this structure. So neutron diffractions, neutrons, just interact with nuclei. Neutrons don't see electrons. I, a beam of neutrons, they just interact with nucleus and diffract. So it's, this is physicists. These nuclei are really there because it's very low temperature. They are precisely located there. And that's the picture a physicist has from, from benzamide molecule. When I look to the crystal structure, structure there are interesting hydrogen bonding systems here. OK. The problem is I can do the same not using neutron diffraction, and I did it using X-ray diffraction. X-rays do not interact with nuclei. They just interact with electrons. So. What usually crystallographers do is to use periodic tape al atoms to, to do what they call solved structure, to find where the atoms are. And what I did is to pick up the experimental X-ray diffraction and admit that it's 100% accurate. There is no error in the experience. You know, life rules, not theory. The experiment is 100% correct. And I subtracted the resolution proposed by the crystallographers based on periodic table atoms. What you see is, are these deformation maps. You can see here, most of the error is in the middle of the bonds. They don't account for anything that is happening in the bonds because their atoms are centered there in the atomic positions. So 
this is the error, but it's not an error. It's just a bad use of mathematics. If, I, if they use extra functions, not only at periodic table atoms, they, they would be able to model this better. You can see here what we would call an oxygen lone pair. It's an error because it was not accounted for by crystallographers. So when I do the error map, I see here a bond, here uh, uh, oxygen lone pair, an oxygen lone pair. So the information is there. We are just not wanting to use them. 99.9% .9 of crystallographers use periodic table atoms. So they are creating this as an error. And they are happy because they created an R factor that if it's below 10%, it's okay to publish. So, but if they use better models, they could go to 1% error, not 10%. So they are just giving it up. Okay, they just don't want to have more work to work with better mathematical models. And here is what it looks like when we use real models like multiple expansions of charge density, you get this. Of course, I can recognize carbons, hydrogens, this carbon in carboxylic group, oxygens, the hydrogen bonding system here, like uh, two amino acids together, it's like this. But the, these peaks are not in the same positions as the atoms in the neutron diffraction. They are elsewhere. The carbons, okay, are close together, but the hydrogens are miles apart. The error can be more than 10%. And hydrogen bond done by a uh, crystallographer is 0.9 angstrom, so 90 p uh, pic picometers. And the real distance is probably 110 picometers. It's more than almost 20 picometers difference. It's 15% error. It's a lot. So the, the atoms are not where they put them, but I can still recognize atoms in molecules. And then I want to transform... Uh, wave functions in something more realistic. So I use the Oenberg call theorems. The first theorem is a one-to-one -one mapping between the charge density and the wave function. Because the charge density is that thing I can measure with X-rays. It's experimental. I go to the lab and measure it. And there is a one-to-one -one mapping and a one-to-one -one mapping with external potential. What this, this means is if you can... The, the, uh, if I have a charge density, it can only be reproduced with the correct wave function. If I have the wrong wave function, I will not, it's impossible to reproduce the same charge density with the wrong wave function. So there is a one-to-one -one mapping. The good thing is that the charge density has three variables. The wave function has, has 300, 400, depends on many atoms. So I reduce the size of my problem to a 3N, uh, 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 three, uh, R3 problem. So, and charge, and, and especially because it's measurable and there is a one-to-one -one relationship. So everything that I can do with wave functions, I can do with charge density. No problem, okay? Because I know that I can, I can deconvolute this charge density in the wave function, or I can produce from the wave function charge density and vice versa, because there is a one-to-one -one mapping. That I cannot be wrong. I cannot get the same charge density from a different wave function. That was demonstrated, not in the original paper because the demonstration is wrong, but later it was. And also I also expect to get a variational functional that enables me to predict properties. What is a variation of uh, a variational functional? It's a functional that from a function, from charge density will give me my property that I measure in the lab. But if I start with a guess solution for the charge density, the the, the energy will be bigger than the true one. Every time I improve my wave function, the energy gets lower. So I can, every time I change a little bit my wave function, if the energy get, gets uh, smaller, I'm in the, in good way. So I can just put a computer doing attempts to get, find better wave functions until I get one that produces the minimum energy or the minimum whatever property I'm looking. Because uh, the charge density is a variational functional. So the, the true solution always produces the lowest value for the observable. All the wrong solutions produce higher values, and that is very important. So just some quick uh, uh, boundary conditions for charge density. Uh, I can produce charge density from the square of the wave function. The, when, when the the, the, the distance goes to infinity when I go miles away from the molecule, there are no charge density. 
the integral to all the space is the number of electrons in the molecule, and this is also an important boundary condition. When I approach a nuclei position, one of, that, of those determined by neutron diffractions, I should get a cusp. Okay? The, the gradient field of the charge density, not charge density, but the gradient field should have a cusp that is equal to twice the atomic charge. Okay? So I get like the spherical average charge density goes twice the atomic charge. So this is an interesting boundary condition. And also this one, that when I go to infinity, I know that charge density will decay the square root of the ionization potential. For instance, if it's, if it's a molecule that is very difficult to ionize, the charge density goes quickly to zero. If it's a molecule that is easy to ionize, charge density goes slowly to, to zero. So I can get the ionization potential directly by the boundary decay of, of charge density. So I start getting information, but I can get more because I can analyze critical points in the topology of charge densities. For instance, uh, if I calculate the points where the gradient of charge density is zero, I can get critical features of my molecule because at these critical points, I can get different topological properties. For instance, this maximum is a maximum in all directions, x, y, and z. So it's a three, mi three minus three critical point. But I have here in the middle of the bonds, a saddle point, which is a maximum in one direction, is like a saddle of a horse. It's a maximum in one direction and a minimum in, in the others. So it's a 3 minus 1 critical point. Okay, so I can calculate the Laplacian, the Hessian of charge density with our second derivatives matrix and just do uh, a unitary transformation. And with a unitary transformation, I get it diagonalized. And this, the trace of the, of the Hessian is. Uh, the Laplacian of charge density. And I get these eigenvalues of charge density. And I can classify these eigenvalues of charge density by rank, which are the number of zero curvatures. By the way, I'm saying curvatures, you probably prefer that I say eigenvalues. But for me, they are cur curvatures. The rank is the number of no zero curvatures. And signature is the sum of the signs of the curvatures. For instance, a maximum is a 3 minus 3 critical point, a saddle point is a 3 minus 1, a, a ring point is a 3 plus 1, and so on. So I can get information about this, and you will see it in a moment. For instance, here is what an atom is. It's a 3 minus 3 critical point in charge density. When I do the topologic analysis, it's a point of zero gradient and three negative curvatures. This is the middle of a bond. And if you see, for instance, if, if I have here an oxygen atom, here an hydrogen atom, the point of the saddle point it will be closer to the most electropositive atom. So I have a measure of electronegativity like, like when I put a, a thing in a bar. You know, by, uh, this is the equilibration point between the forces between the atoms. So if it's at 50% of the bond, it's equal electronegative. The atoms have electronegativities. If the bond is closer to an atom, that atom is more electropositive. The other atom is more electronegative. But they also can... <laughs> pick up the eigenvalues of the Hessian and calculate the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are the directions where the charge density drops faster. And I can create gradient fields. If I can create a gradient finger, uh, field along the direction the charge density drops faster, it's a bond. A bond is the direction where the charge density drops faster. So what I get is bond paths that our traditional chemists ca call bonds, but with a, a difference. For instance, if this is cyclobutane, the bond, it will not be a straight line. The, the eigenvector of the Hessian goes in curvature. If you have a cyclobutane, the tangent of the, the curvature of the bond path with the straight segment that joins the atoms is what the organic chemists call ring tension. And exactly the value predicted by organic chemists as the ring tension. Because there is a tension in the ring, the, the paths, the form. So I can have experimental ring tension, experimental bond paths and uh, ring, uh, ring critical points, etc., etc., cage points. Et I can define everything that is chemical about my structure with the topological anal analysis of the, the, the charge. And you can see, finally, what is an atom in a molecule. Here is the charge density, but I have here the charge density, but I can get the gradient field. And the gradient field has a particularity. 
if I have the gradient of charge density, if there is a surface where all the lines curve to become normal to that surface, the, the, if it, this is a zero flow surface. So this zero flow surface have no forces. So I can just get, the, get them in molecule and isolate these bits of molecule. For instance, this is a fluorine, a boron atom, a boron atom, a fluorine. I can divide BF3 in four different atoms that I can transfer to other situations because there are no tensions. It's a zero flow surface. The gradient lines do not flow through the surface. So there is no flow of charge density through them. I can isolate a carboxylic group, a methyl group, an ethane, uh, whatever, uh, alcohol. I can isolate these groups from the gradient field, finding the surface with zero flow for that particular density. Okay, and that's what was done here in this example. But also, I can recover Lewis, like no bonding pairs in water, and calculate the angle in where they are. Why? Because I can look at Laplacian, or you know, to the symmetric of Laplacian, and why the symmetrical of Laplacian? Because the Laplacian is, where is negative where charge accumulates, and is positive where is there is charge depletion. So, if I look to, to the topology of the Laplacian, I will see maxima in non bonding pairs. Oxygen has two maxima in Laplacian fields. I can calculate the angle between these two maxima and see, actually see, the non bonding pairs that Lewis predicted. Okay? The, uh, and uh, as it can be seen here, these pairs that Lewis postulated in his theory can be found in Laplacian map. If I depict Laplacian maps, there are maximums in, in, long, in long pairs. And that can be done experimentally or theoretically or both. So I have access to that. And also I can predict the reactivity. For instance, an, what is an electrophilic? An electrophilic is a place that has been depleted of electrons, is where Laplacian is positive. What is a nucleophilic? A nucleophilic has a lot of electrons, that's, that's where Laplacian is negative. So points where Laplacian is the L is positive, meaning Laplacian negative, that's where an electrophilic attack can occur, and a nucleophilic attack can occur where L is negative. So if I map Laplacian in a molecule, like with colors, I can see, for instance, if there is an, uh, like an uh, alkoxid group coming, I say the alkoxid will go to exactly the point in the molecule where the Laplacian is positive. For instance, if I see BH3, which has an empty orbital, is acidic, it will go where the Laplacian is negative. So I ca can predict the approach of molecules to my molecule and where they are going to react, either nucleophilics or electrophilics, the way ca organic chemists did it a lot uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. So, all this nomenclature with the arrows is just, these dots are just negative Laplacians. The, the, the point of the error is just positive Laplacian points. So, the topological analysis of charge density gives me all the traditional chemistry. That's where Lewis can come back, okay? Because it's forgiven. And also, this one thing that I don't have here. When you look at kinetic energy in quantum chemistry, what you see is the second derivative of the wave function. When you look to the classical mechanics, kinetic energy is one half m v squared, the square of the velocity, so it's the square of the gradient. The, the difference between the square of the gradient and the Laplacian of the wave function is the Laplacian. But because the Laplacian, you can look, let me go, you can look at the Laplacian like the gradient of the gradient. The gradient of the gradient due to the, the Gauss theorem, when, when you calculate the gradient of the gradient over a volume, you transform it to the surface through the Gaussian theorem, it will be a zero flow surface. So the Laplacian, the flow of the, lap, of the gradient is zero. It means the classical and quantum mechanics are equal. So an atom is a volume encompassed by a surface that everything that is under that volume Quantum and classic are equal. In each point inside the volume, quantum and classic are different. And how much they are different? By the Laplacian. But over what's called a, a proper atom, a zero flow surface defined in the volume, quantum and classic are equal. The kinetic energy integrated for that volume doesn't matter if I use classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, I will reach the same value. So it's something that joins different views of life. 
And that is interesting because sometimes we have to put opposites together and find some common point. And common point here is the atoms in the quantum system. Okay? And finally, thanks for your attention. Thank you again for your presentation. Uh, I wonder if anybody would like to ask questions. Please. You mentioned that you can uh, detect experimentally the signal of the Laplacian of the density of the electronic density. Yeah. Is that so X-ray diffraction? Yeah. Of course, you cannot detect it close to the atomic position because of the X-ray resolution. For instance, if you do, do it in a synchrotron, where you can tune the wavelength, uh, you, uh, you can detect more. But if you are like using copper radiation or molybdenum radiation or silver radiation, uh, you get like uh, a cut in charge density. There are holes around the atoms that are uh, unavailable due to the to the diffraction wavelength, you know, because you are limited by... It. So if you can go to like to one picometer in wavelength, you would get everything. But you are limited usually by 50, 70, for instance, molybdenum is 71 picometers. So there is a limit. You cannot go smaller than 71 picometers from, from the atom. But usually lone pairs are a little bit further away eventually you notice them, especially in the fraction maps like I showed you in the beginning. When you do the error maps, you clearly see the contours of the error corresponding to the, to the non-bonding pairs. Okay, if, you, if I like go here. Okay, here, you can see here the non-bonding pair and here the other non-bonding pair. It's clearly there. It's not error. Okay, it's too, it's too much well-defined to be instrumental error. Okay. So, so uh, look into the shape of the, of the diffraction pattern, you can detect maximum, minimum, minimum saddle points, atom, ring, and point, ring critical point points, are everything, the, yeah. Are the bones. Yeah. Okay. No further questions, so thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Now we'll have the last, today's last presentation. Our colleague, Dr. Antonio Cordova, who will talk about counting like lattice points in, in oscillations. Okay. That will be an interesting one. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the deference of listening to my talk. <laughs> uh, as, as you know, uh, mathematicians uh, are um, reductionists. And we uh, dream or pretend to, uh, to deduce rigorously the laws of science from a small set of first principles. Um, so the main purpose of my talk today will be to apply that principle, that philosophy, to the periodic table. Um, in, in the plan to, to do that, these are my collaborators. Uh, Professor Charles Pfefferman from Princeton University and Luis Seco from the University of Toronto. Uh, and we have published uh, several papers uh, in, in, in journals like uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Revista Matemática Iberoamericana, or Communication in Partial Differential Equation. Now, one of the advantages of being the last speaker is that I have not uh, to to have confront the task of uh, presenting terminology or convincing you of the interest of, of theories or definition. So, uh, for most purposes of chemistry, the Bohr-Oppenheimer non-relativistic model of a molecule is enough. Not, not for every, as uh, has been pointed out here, sometimes we have to take into account relativistic eff effect. But let's say we can uh, go a, a, long, a long path with the Schrodinger model uh, in the version of the Bohr or Oppenheimer. So in, 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 that, in, 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 in this description, a molecule uh, has m nuclei of positive charges, C1, Cm, E. Uh, the Cs are integer and E is the, the charge of the electron. And they are placed in, in position, a position Y1 
YM and Euclidean space R3. Um, uh, then uh, uh, we have n quantized electron in position x1, xn, which will be described by the, uh, the wave function. Um, this is the Hamiltonian, so the, uh, the so to have a Schrodinger equation, and the Hamiltonian uh, has this uh, shape. Uh, this is a sum in the number of electrons. Uh, Planck constant, this is the mass of the electron. Um, this is the Laplacian in three dimensional uh, space corresponding to the coordinate of the J L storm. So uh, I have a different notation in mathematics. We usually use this form, this uh, symbol for the Laplacian. Um, my predecessor used the, the, the other, but that's okay. Um, then this is the, the attraction term between the nuclei, the, the, the nuclei ZK and the electron at position xj. This is the Coulomb attraction term. And uh, here we have the repulsion of the electron and the repulsion between the nuclei. And so this, this is the, the Hamiltonian. Um, uh, this Hamiltonian at on the space of function, which uh, is a, a mathematic we write uh, as an this is anti-symmetric, anti-symmetric size uh, uh, tensor product uh, of n copies of the space L2 of R3 tensor Z2. Z2 is the group plus one minus one. Now, uh, just uh, one comment. The, uh, this symbol, anti-symmetric tensor product, uh, is a reflection of Pauli exclusion principle. The fact that the electrons are fermions and then the, the wave function has to be anti-symmetric. And this C2 take into account uh, the spin. So plus one will be a spin up, let's say, minus one a spin down. And then, uh, okay, so if you believe me that this is the space of, uh, of the um, in, in important or relevant wave function for this problem, for this molecule problem, then the ground state energy is, uh, is uh, given by this function, E of Z, Z is the atomic number uh, of, I mean, if Z is the number of, uh, of uh, Z, is, uh, I mean, uh, this Z is Z1, Zn, the number of, of, uh, of positive charge of, of nuclei, and then there is an inferior of the inner product of the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function side with itself, the inferior over all the wave function of with half not one in this Hilbert space. And then uh, there is another inferior over the position of the nuclei, Y, and finally an inferior over the number of electrons which are involved. Um, this is a rather complicated uh, uh, functional. Uh, it's a uh, uh, non-trivial uh, number to, to, to estimate, and this is absolutely Okay, so this is the 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 uh, uh, quantum uh, ground state energy of such a molecule. Now, uh, in the dream of reducing chemistry to mathematics, <laughs> we will need to to get a very accurate uh, computation of this number. We have. To if we were able to compute this with a great accuracy, then we can reduce many of uh, chem phenom chemical phenomena to, to mathematics. But uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we are far away of, get, of getting such an accuracy. Um, so uh, uh, this is just only a, a <coughs> dream, but it's not a reality that I can, we can use uh, uh, this model in, in, in such a way to describe most of the uh, chemical phenomena. Now, we can be uh, a little bit more modest uh, and try to, 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 to predict some properties of the periodic table. In that case, in that case, 
we will just consider not a molecule, but a neutral atom. So Z protons place at the origin, let's say. Um, let us take units, as we say in mathematics, so that the, the, uh, the charge of the electron is one, um, the mass of the electron is the, taken in such a way that this is one, and then the, the Hamiltonian simplified to this form. We have uh, the attraction of the electron to the, to the nuclei, and then this is the repulsion between the, the electron. And also, uh, let me just believe me, that with uh, certain mathematical manipulation about the symmetry group, some mathematics, we can eliminate the spin out of the consideration. So for, for the computation, we may, we may work in this space, which is somehow easier to understand. And we know that uh, the only difference will be perhaps a chain of value of some constant, but not uh, at all uh, the in the nature of the mathematical problem involved in understanding the, the atoms. Um, now, uh, if we do that, then this space is somehow easier to understand. This is a space of the uh, wave function. Uh, remember that each one of these coordinates has three dimensions, so we are in, this, in the space of 3C. 3C dimension are the 3C. And the, the, the wave function is anti-symmetric, which means that when we change the position of two electrons, then the, the wave function change signal. Or in general, if we apply the permutation of the, of the electron, then uh, we get the same value multiplied by plus or minus sign, depending upon the signature of the permutation sign. Okay, so now this is the uh, more simplified problem than the one for the, for the molecule, but even so, this problem is, uh, is very, very, very difficult. And the reason, as has been pointed out before, is that uh, this term, the term uh, in which the electron interact, uh, uh, make this uh, problem, the problem of uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, find the, the, the minimum or the inferior of the energy, the, a, a very complicated, very complicated problem that we cannot solve at all explicitly. Uh, some mathematics uh, uh, applied to, to, to this setting tell us that what we are looking, this energy of the atom, depending upon the atomic number, is in fact the, an eigenvalue of uh, the lowest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian in that is the space of wave function. Um, associate to, to, the, the, to the wave function, we have a, an electronic density. Um, the electronic density will have the standard meaning that the probability of getting electron in the region of the space is given by this integral. Okay, so this is, this is the mathematical problem, trying to understand, uh, to understand uh, how this function uh, behave as a function of the atomic number Z. Um, it's a very complicated problem. Okay, so now uh, uh, what the chemist or the physicist, the mathematician uh, do is to uh, think in this term. Let's suppose that we are so lucky that instead of having that electronic, I mean the, the potential given by the electronic um, interaction between different electrons, we, we will have just a one electron potential V. And then the Hamiltonian, let's call H tilde of Z, is given as a sum uh, over the number of electrons of uh, the Laplacian minus the Laplacian plus this potential acting on the potential on the electron Sx. Then the problem uh, simplifies a lot, dramatically simplified, because by separation of var variable, it becomes a, a problem in three dimensions. And even so, if we use the fact that the potential is symmetric, radially symmetric, then it becomes a one-dimensional problem, a, what we call an ordinary differential equation that can be solved explicitly. And that is great. And then the, the strategy that uh, the, the chemist uh, used to do is to, let's say, let's, let's be uh, so intelligent that we can approximate 
are Hamiltonian A to Z by such A tilde of Z and see what happened. And one way of doing that approximation is just uh, think for a while that we know, we know the electron density rho. Then, uh, if we know the electron, electron density rho, there is a, a, a candidate for that, uh, for the potential, and the, this, is the, this is the candidate. Uh, here is the repulsion, the attraction term between the, the nuclei and the electron, placed as x, and this is the, this integral, this is the one, the Colombian potential, and so this is the, the integral, is the, the, the repulsion term between the electronic cloud to the, to the electron at position x. So, uh, we have this, 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 uh, this H tilde of C, uh, we thinking that we have a good, a good electronic density, that we know the electronic density wrong, and then, the, the, as I say, the problem simplified enormously, dramatically, and we can find, in fact, the, the, the wave function for, for, the, for the whole problem uh, is called, this is a Hartree-Fock, I am, yes, Hartree-Fock. So the Hartree-Fock wave function is the anti product of the eigenfunction of the three-dimensional uh, uh, operator, which we know completely. Uh, some, this is anti symmetry product, uh, sometimes I'll call a Slater determinant. Um, so we can, uh, we, we can just, pretending that we know the, the potential V, or, the, or let's say the, the electronic density rho, we can just uh, write down uh, a formula for this, uh, for this uh, Hartree-Fock uh, this um, wave function. And then uh, uh, there is a, a density associated to this Hartree-Fock uh, Hartree uh, function, and the, the density times out, this is an elementary computation that is given by this formula. It's the sum of the first uh, Z uh, eigenfunction of the three-dimensional potential uh, V that we have there. Okay, that's fine, but then uh, for consistency, we would like that the, the density we arrive is equal to the density we started with. And this is called the Hartree-Fock equation. It's a, a strange equation because it's not a partial differential equation, it's not an integral equation, um, it's an strange equation. What our fellow chemists used to do is to solve this equation by iteration. So they just start with the density rho, find, go from this, from this procedure and find a, 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 a hard fog density and then start again the process with this density and get another and another and hope that the, the, the procedure converge and converge quickly enough to a solution of our problem. It's not obvious at all that uh, that conversion has to take place. And it's not obvious at all uh, what is a good choice for the original, uh, for the original density rho. Okay. okay, but then, uh, fortunately, there is another approximate theory. Hartree Fock is uh, an approximate theory. There is an, uh, another approximate theory, uh, which is Thomas Fermi, Thomas Fermi theory. Thomas Fermi is, is calling in mathematics or in physics and a statistical theory of atoms. It's a, it's a theory that seems to be better when we have many electrons and so on. But uh, in, in Thomas Fermi theory, uh, uh, we just uh, uh, give us a formula to relate uh, the potential with the, with, the, with the density in a different form. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's a way of, of computing the, the negative eigenvalues of this, uh, uh, of this uh, um, Redinger operator uh, under certain reasonable condition upon the potential V. Okay? And so, let's consider this, this uh, operator, let's consider 
the corresponding eigenfunction. This is a three-dimensional problem that we can solve, or we can pretend that we can solve. Um, as I say, if we start with the uh, uh, radial potential, then it's a one-dimensional ODE. And so we have this eigenfunction, and then it's just uh, a question of uh, an easy mathematical manipulation to, to realize that the, uh, the Hartree-Fock energy, I mean the minimum of the, of the Hartree-Fock uh, uh, energy functional acting so the, sobre the Hartree-Fock uh, wave function, is just the sum of the negative eigenvalues of this, uh, of this Hamiltonian, of this, uh, Hamiltonian operator. And the density is just the sum of the square of the first eigenfunction. And now, uh, in the Thomas Fermi, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a way, as I say, of relating these two, uh, these two objects, the potential and the wave function, and that is an important chapter of mathematical analysis called semi-classical approximation. Um, this is an important part of mathematics, and one of the main theorems or result in that uh, semi semi-classical approximation is Hermann Weyl. In fact, Hermann Weyl was a collaborator of Schrödinger. Um, uh, and so Hermann Weyl uh, has a, a way of computing the number of eigenvalues of such an operator of, uh, of say, of energy less than or equal to lambda which are uh, in a certain, in, in, in a region of space. Uh, suppose we, we take this operator, take a region in three-dimensional space, and consider the eigenvalue problem with Dirichlet boundary condition equal to zero, and then you find the, uh, the, the eigenfunction, find the, the eigenvalues, and Hermann Weyl uh, uh, has a, a formula uh, which gives us uh, the main term in the asymptotic expansion of that, uh, of, of, of that number of eigenvalues. That, that Hermann Weyl formula is a reminiscence, half a reminiscence of a classical formula in number theory of counting lati lattice point inside a region of Euclidean space. It's a classical problem in number theory, a completely different field of mathematics. So uh, using that, uh, those ideas, of uh, semi-classical approximation and Hermann Weyl formula, one can write down the Hartree-Fock equation in a more, much more pleasant form. So this is uh, this formula is the, the one I wrote before. Is the relation you, we know the density we can uh, uh, produce a potential by uh, here uh, is the Coulombian term. And this is the 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 repulsion. Of, the, of that uh, electronic density uh, to the electron of position X. So this is uh, just what I wrote before. But th the new thing is that with the Hermann Weyl uh, formulas, one can relate these two objects in a different form. And it turns out that the electronic density is just a constant, explicit constant, uh, it doesn't matter, it's just a constant, multiplied by the potential is negative uh, to the power 3 half. That Hermann Weyl result, and when one have this, then uh, we can just write down Hartree-Fock equation in a much uh, easier f uh, manner. Because if we take the Laplacian of this term, then this disappears because it is a fundamental solution, and then uh, here uh, we, we get the, the electronic density, and then uh, what come out is this uh, well-known Thomas Fermi equation for the potential V. And this Thomas Fermi equation uh, can be solved. And uh, in the solution of the Thomas Fermi equation, give us as a byproduct that the dependence on the atomic gamma C can be somehow re removed because there is a trivial scaling. The density is Z squared rho to the C to the 1 third X, uh, and, and the potential scale like C to the 4 third. And uh, here you get uh, c to the one third, and in fact, this uh, this uh, this term c to the one third has an interesting uh, uh, meaning in terms of the of the atom because it gives us that the radius of the atom 
is like z, the, number, the atomic number to the minus one third, it's predicted by a theory. And also that the, the, the average length distance between two atoms is z to the minus two third. But okay, so this is just what the, with these two theories, which are approximate theory, nothing to do, I mean, nothing as precise as I uh, asked at the beginning, which was the quantum energy. Okay, so I, I uh, introduced this because, uh, I mean, the purpose of my talk is to give you now some rigorous result about the quantum energy of the, uh, of the atom, of atomic number Z. And this is not just the Hartree Fock or Thomas Fermi. This is just the whole quantum energy uh, computed over uh, that uh, complicated set of wave functions. And now, uh, this is uh, what we know in mathematics now, uh, it's a theorem, that this uh, quantum energy has an expression, uh, I would say asymptotic development, and there is a first term, uh, Z is for Thomas Fermi, the power Z to the 7 over 3. This uh, term was uh, figured out by Thomas Fermi at the beginning of quantum, quantum theory, around 1927. But it was proved rigorously as a mathematical theorem by Elliot Blip and Barry Simon in 1973. Let me, let me just say that uh, this, both of them were at Princeton. And at, uh, in 1974, I was a junior faculty at Princeton University, and I have the privilege of attending the, the lecture given by Lip and Simon uh, of, of the proof of this theory. It's a fantastic piece of work uh, by Lip and Simon. Okay, so now uh, early also in the, in, the the in the history of quantum mechanics, it was known that this term has to be, has to be corrected and that uh, the correction was of the order of c square. And uh, this, uh, this was based on numerical result, but we were explained it in 1950, 50, uh, phenomenology, phenomenological explanation by Scott in terms of the screaming of the inner integral, inner electron, I'm sorry, the inner electron behave in the, uh, as if they have no electronic interaction between them. Um, uh, this, this term was uh, proved rigorously as a mathematical theorem in the, in the period of the 80s. Um, the main names involved are Hughes, Siedemtop, and Weikar. Um, uh, this is also, uh, this, this, this two results are known also for molecule. Huh? Okay, so now there is another effect, a weaker effect, which was discovered by Paul Dirac in uh, 1930, but it's, uh, <laughs> you know, a genius uh, uh, deduction, and then this uh, Zwinger uh, later in 90, around 1981 uh, make more precise the consideration of Dirac. That's the reason why this is called the term of uh, Zwinger Dirac. Um, it's, it's weaker, it's z to the 5 over 3, and this term was proved rigorously as a mathematical theorem by my two collaborators, Jean Feffelman and Seco, in the 90s. And again, this is a fantastic piece of work. Okay, so now uh, this term are, as you see, a decreasing power of the atomic number. But uh, coming out of, of the proof of Feffelman and Seco, uh, uh, was clear that the next term was not, was not now a, a, a power of the atomic number z, but it had a different nature, a more complicated nature. It was an oscillating, it's, it's an oscillating term, an almost periodic term, in fact, almost a trigonometric polynomial in c. And that is very appealing from the point of view of the periodic table. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't, know that we don't nominate the constant in all this uh, development to say that uh, with the state of our knowledge about the constant, we have a mathematical explanation of the periodic table. But at least we can offer, <laughs> from the mathematic point of view, uh, an term which is a candidate to take into account the contribution to the energy of the 
balance, electron of balance. If we achieve to do that with all the constant, then uh, uh, the goal of my, of my talk will be fantastic and we have from the first principle a explanation of the predictive. Okay, so now let me just say uh, briefly uh, and, uh, one of the reasons why I bother you with Thomas Fermi and Hartley Fock is because I need those functions to describe this term, all right? So the, the, uh, this term, the, the oscillating term, is a sum, is a, a finite sum. L is an integer from one to a certain number LTF. LTF is of the order of magnitude of C to the one third. Remember, C to the one third. Here, I, there is, this is a coefficient that, although it looks something, uh, is, uh, is, is not too difficult to, to, to manage. And in fact, this behaves very much like a, like a constant. It's a slow variant uh, uh, coefficient. Uh, here, we have uh, this term. Uh, this term you see depends upon L, and uh, also depends upon Z, and uh, is this integral, here we have this integral too. This integral are, uh, uh, are uh, converging. In fact, uh, th this integral takes place only on a finite part of, of, uh, of space. R cannot be too big. The reason is that the, the um, Thomas Fermi potential decreases more quickly than 1 over r squared. So if l is big enough, then this term will be zero, and the contribution to the integral is zero. Um, similarly here. Okay? Uh, therefore, uh, we don't have to worry about the conversion of this integral. Uh, this integral is a bona fide integral, finite and easy, or relatively easy to compute. But we have this argument. The, uh, um, here is the Thomas Fermi potential, which uh, I recall, we have this scaling, so this scale in, in terms of the atomic number Z. And what it is uh, uh, mm, remarkable in this, and the, the oscillatory character, is by the fact that the, the, the function mu applied to this argument is an oscillatory, uh, is an, uh, oscillatory function. In fact, it, uh, it can be reduced to a sine of sine and cosine, a trigonometric polynomial. So, uh, in, in, the, in this setting, uh, uh, mu is, the, is a periodic function of period one. Is, uh, that can be, when we take the, all the, uh, the units uh, appropriate, uh, it can be uh, reduced to be the distance from the point x to the integer square minus 1 over 12. Uh, 1 over 12 is make this function to have average zero on the interval, on the, on the period, period integral, and this is the shape of this function, okay? Now, this, this is the, the periodic part, the oscillatory part, and, oh, sorry. Okay, so now, uh, Remember that this is a, a sum in, in this uh, in L, it's a finite sum. This is a, a, a slow variant coefficient that we think uh, that it is constant. And, and here we have mu applied to something which it is uh, oscillating. Uh, mu is oscillating applied to, to, to this thing. Uh, okay, so now here is the theorem. The theorem uh, is the purpose for me to illustrate you <laughs> about <laughs> uh, this oscillating term. So the theorem that we prove is that this term is oscillating between minus c to the three half and c to the three half. It has the average of c to the three half, and these uh, are universal constant. And so this uh, is not depends only upon the size of the atomic number, but it's changing, it's oscillating. Um, what we expect in a period of time. Okay, so now, uh, uh, obviously, I uh, um, don't be afraid. I will try to give you the detail of the proof. The proof is published in this journal I mentioned at the beginning, but uh, I can give you some uh, flavor of what it is involved. So the the 
uh, using uh, some standard analytical technique, uh, which is known in, in, in number theory as the van der Korput method, uh, which is a combination of a stationary phase plus Poisson summation formula, one can uh, look as uh, atomic energy oscillating function as a trigonometric, as a sum with this shape. There is a sum, uh, there is a parameter lambda, lambda will be a, a C, you know, from 1 to C, or C to the 1 third, from 1 to lambda. Here we have a function F, uh, uh, which is uh, a slowly variant. Here we have uh, an oscillating, an, an oscillating uh, uh, periodic function uh, of average ego, um, and this is the phase phi, which uh, is inside the argument of the periodic function mu. And then uh, this, this in, in, in with respect to phi, we need to, 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 to have that uh, the second derivative of phi is strictly positive. So phi is not linear. If phi is linear, then uh, all the, uh, the, the I mean, the, 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 th the corresponding theorem will be false. It's important that phi is not linear. In fact, um, the critical points are not in general. So f phi is uh, a function which have second derivative strictly positive. Mu is periodic of function of average zero, and as I say, f is a constant. So this, this is uh, the kind of object that we have to deal with. Um, and this, as I said, uh, is an object which is a character which appears in, in many theory of in number theory. For instance, if f is 1 and mu of x is sine of cosine, say e to the 2 pi x, if phi of f is x squared, this sum which uh, I have written here are called Gauss sum or Gaussian sum, and they play an important role in the theory of quadratic reciprocity and, the, and in many theories in, in mathematics. And in that case, this, the, the, uh, the value of S lambda uh, in, in, uh, typically is the square root of lambda. If you take f equal 1 and mu of x to be the fractionary part of x, x minus the integer part uh, normalized uh, with subtract minus 1 half to have average zero, then s represents the error term in counting lattice point under the curve y equal phi of x. So it's, this is a, so a classical problem in number zero. We have a curve, we dilate the curve, and we count how many lattice points lies inside. So the main term is the area, and there is an error term, uh, and the nature of that error term is an outstanding open problem in mathematical analysis. So uh, this is a reminiscent also of what I mentioned before, of the uh, hellman weil formula for counting eigenvalues of the Hamilton operator, of the Rengiger operator in regional space. So th here are some, uh, some uh, what I said before, uh, uh, and for, for, for typical, for this lattice point problem uh, in mathematics, we know that the error term, uh, first Gauss observed that the error term is always less than or equal the length of the, of the curve, which is like the parameter, then using van der Korput, I mean, Poisson summation and um, another uh, tool, uh, uh, stationary phase, so with harmonic analysis, the error term could be reduced to lambda to, to the two third, and it's an outstanding open problem in, in mathematics. It's an open pro a problem we have uh, almost 300 years of antiquity, and it's an open problem uh, uh, to, to the, the conjecture is that in that case the error term should be of the, the order of the square root of lambda, of square root of lambda to the one half plus epsilon. So this is a, 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 a Fortunately, for our case, for, for our function uh, phi uh, here, to prove this theorem, uh, we have uh, that uh, the function mu is much better behaved than the fractionary part. The fractionary part, which is relevant to the counting lattice point, have a Fourier coefficient with decay like 1 over n. The n coefficient decay like 1 over n. If for this function, complicated function in, in my 
for this complicated function, if it were not uh, uh, the function, I mean, for this function mu, the coefficient decay like 1 over n squared, and that uh, out is a dramatic chain which make this, e if this sum easier to compute. What it is more difficult is the, to, to satisfy the condition that the phase, the corresponding phase uh, in this, uh, okay, this condition that the phase has a second derivative strictly positive, which is crucial for, for the estimate to, to, to be satisfied. And uh, in order to do that, we have to, to make a computer assisted proof. I mean, using the computer in a very precise manner with the arithmetic of interval to compute the derivative of the complicated expression given by that integral, the second, the second derivative is strictly positive. And it's one of the first uh, uh, computer assisted proof which appear in mathematics now. Is, is a field, uh, uh, new computer system. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Professor Cardinal. Uh, any questions? No. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to end this session by thanking all the presenters. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm pretty sure that most of my uh, people present would have learned a lot, even if they're not mathematics, mathematicians, or chemistry, which I'm neither, so I learned more. And uh, as usual, there'll be tea in the, the, the entrance room from here, so you're all invited to get some biscuits, if, if our budget enables for biscuits. Okay. Thank you.